I'm Olive Gohan. I head up the life insurance practice in Mazars here in Dublin. I have over 25 years of experience in the life insurance industry in Ireland and spent about 10 of those years in the cross-border sector. Before working in the cross-border sector, I knew almost nothing about it. Um, I thought it was tiny. Um, I thought very few people worked in it. I now know differently and that it's key and centre of our industry um, and contributes an enormous amount of premiums um, proportionately every year. Um, and as we go through this session, we hope you come to a, an appreciation of, of its importance, of its unique challenges, um, of the different markets and the different customers, and I suppose of the, of the bright future that we believe exists for our sector. So the insurance industry in Ireland is, a, I suppose, a, a key industry. The cross-border industry sells to you know, over 100 countries worldwide, and we have you know, about 25 million customers. In 2017, I suppose, um, we, we got some of the statistics earlier. Um, I've got ballpark numbers here, but roughly 25 billion premiums, depending on whether you're looking at growth or net and so on. Um, but 25 billion of 39 billion life insurance premiums are from the cross-border sector. That's a huge proportion. In terms of suppose, relative size, twice as much new business premiums come from the cross-border as the domestic sector. But, you know, we've got about half as many employees. But that's still an enormous number. And single premium business is huge. It's, it's the biggest portion. And the vast majority of that is unit linked. This shows a bit of the history of premiums that took a dip in the recession, has recovered since then. And while the numbers aren't public yet, 2018 you know, has been a very good year. The top countries, um, Italy. Um, Italy is the biggest market. Um, and, and the history goes back to Intesa and some great stories that Colin Fagan, if he's here, might share with you over coffee. Um, the UK market is second in order of size followed by Germany, France, and Sweden. And these markets are represented by our speakers here today, and we're very privileged to have them with us. And I'd like you to um, show a warm welcome to, um, from Italy, first of all, um, Neil Guinan, CEO of AXA MPS Financial. From, from the UK market, um, Michael Leahy, CEO of Prudential International Assurance. And from the German market, um, Liam O'Keefe, CRO and HOF of Canada Life Europe. <laughs> so we'll start by going back to the beginning. Um, there were a few key moments in the history of the cross-border sector. I suppose first was the setting up of the IFSC, and that was, you know, a tax incentive zone that offered this was a preferential corporation tax rate until you know, approximately 2005, and also offered a gross roll-up environment for life insurance business. And the second important, I suppose, moment was the 1994 Third Life Directive, um, which you know, enabled countries to sell on a cross-border basis. Now our panelists will touch on these as we go through our session. We, we leave it there and we'll go to the panel. So the first um, company that set up in the cross-border space in Ireland was Jay Rothschilds. And that was one of the foundations of what is Prudential International today um, in, in the UK market. Um, Prudential International Assurance is currently one of the leading writers of cross-border business in the UK. And I'll hand over to Michael to um, talk to us a bit about the UK story, the Prudential story, and how important was tax within that? So, tax is crucial. Um, normally, when we talk about tax in international in Ireland, it's corporate tax. But in this case, it's nothing to do with corporation tax. It's actually to do with policyholder tax. The UK unusually has two different tax regimes for insurance, depending on whether you buy it from a UK company or a foreign company. Um, if you buy it from a UK company, the company deducts a certain amount of tax each year as the policy goes along. And then if you're a basic rate taxpayer, when you take your money out, there's no extra tax due. If you're a high rate taxpayer, there's some additional tax. Um, if you buy your policy from a foreign company, 
then the policy grows tax-free and you pay full tax at your marginal rate when you take the money out at the end. And from a HMRC perspective, it's designed to be broadly tax neutral, but for particular individuals, there can be advantages depending on whether you think your tax rate in the future is likely to be higher or lower. You will select from either a UK company or a foreign company. And as Olive suggested earlier, it was the introduction of the gross roll-up tax regime that allowed Ireland to compete in that space. And that was the whole reason why companies began to come here um, what, nearly 30 years ago at this stage. And it was to offer that choice of tax regimes to the policyholder. That's the driver. Thanks, Michael. Now, the real explosion in the sector came a little bit later in the 90s um, with the, what I call the Italian wave. Um, and I suppose this was a sector that um, Colin Fagan and the IDA were, were, were key to in the early days. Um, it was led by the arrival of San Paolo Life um, and quickly followed by others such as Monte de Paschi, INA, Vicenza and Arcavita. Now, as we saw earlier, Italy is the current is currently the largest market for writing of new business premiums. And Neil, I'll hand over to you to talk to us about the key drivers of the success of the cross-border sector in Italy. Yeah, thanks, Olive. Yeah, well, it, you know, this story goes back over 20 years. And I would say you know, the, the main things I think about there is that there was a, an opportunistic approach by Ireland and a great entrepreneurial spirit in, 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 in winning this business in, in, in the first place. Uh, the IDA and Colin Fagan and, and others uh, looked to, to Italy and saw that there was a new opportunity there. There were banks who were looking to get into insurance and looking to expand the type of products that they offered to their customers. And they saw that for in the Italian market, the traditional players were very much uh, with profits. Uh, they had a traditional type of business. and. Uh, even the regulation in Italy was uh, w was very much linked towards that, and they, while you know they very much wanted to get into that business as well, they saw that unit linked, which was you know quite uh, established in Ireland and in the UK, the unit linked was was a type of business that they that they saw as, as a as, as an opportunity for the future. So the problem, though, in Italy was that they had no real experience in that, and uh, Ireland. Uh, uh, and, and a number of players went over, went over to Italy, had meetings with some of the big groups and persuaded them that co come to Ireland, we've got the experience, we've got a very stable regulatory uh, regime uh, uh, which was open for, for, for doing business and we had a skilled workforce uh, in this and we also had a number of companies who were either in the third party administration uh, field or looking to get into that so we were going to be able to offer that expertise to the company. So really it was a case of they were able to get up and running very quickly uh, and, uh, and, that, and that started and it grew from there. And you know, uh, let's say one thing I'd have always thought about without being in the cross-border business before was all, was all about tax. But mm -hmm. in fact at the start it wasn't so much about tax. Our corporation tax rate helps <coughs> now, but so does or you know, the flexibility and adaptability uh, of Ireland in, o over the years in terms of evolving the, the product offer, like things like VAs or that type of things. Uh, but also the skilled uh, workforce uh, has helped and the growth of, a, of an IFSC type uh, regime has, has meant that there's a lot of skills from lots of different countries coming into Ireland. So we remain a good place to do business. Thanks, Neil. Um, so we've heard about some of the tax reasons, some of the regulatory opportunities, some of the expertise and skills that were here in Ireland. Liam, how important were those factors in, in relation to the German cross-border market? So uh, ju just to go down through them, in, in terms of uh, policyholder taxation, that wasn't an issue. The policyholder taxation is the same, whether you take out a, a German company's policy or an Irish company's policy. In terms of regulatory opportunities, very similar to Italy, um, up to 1994, the products were uniform and prescribed by the regulator, and uh, even after 94, the industry didn't hugely change from that. A lot of guarantees and uh, most investment in German government bonds. So uh, I, I, we would have seen the opportunity, perhaps unlike Italy, it wasn't a case of persuading German companies to come to Ireland, more a case of 
of companies based in Ireland or in the UK in going into Germany to, to sort of see the opportunity to provide unit linking. Uh, in the case of Germany, though, it really had to be unit linking with guarantees. So, uh, so, so uh, that really was, was an important distinction. Okay, thank you, Liam. Um, and I might stay with you for a minute. Um, the, the regulations permitted, a, I suppose, two alternatives to set up, a, a, to establish a branch or to transact on a freedom of services basis. Um, Liam, would you mind explaining these two options and, I suppose, how complex a choice or decision was that for companies? Okay, so I suppose while in both cases um, the central bank is going to be your, your prudential supervisor because you're, you're an Irish company, um, there are some distinctions. I suppose that the key question is, is a question of commitment to the market you're going into, whether you want to be seen as an onshore player or an offshore player, uh, how much you want to look like the domestic players. Uh, in the case of Germany, it's quite a cautious uh, customer base and quite a cautious uh, broker base. So, you know, you, you need to have a presence there to, to emphasize the fact that you're committed to the market. Uh, in terms of then the, the sort of the structure, well, if you have a branch, you have to have officers for that branch, a number of different positions. So it is a commitment in terms of putting people there on the ground. Um, there are some tax implications uh, if you have a branch. And also, in terms of some of the regulations like anti-money laundering, whether it's uh, home su supervision or host supervision, having a branch uh, is, is different. But uh, notwithstanding the fact, though, I, I think if you're... A, if you're if you're intending to sell a lot of business across a lot of, company, a lot of countries and not too much in, in each country, then the overhead of having a branch in, in countries could be quite high. But if, like us, you're focusing on a, on a large market and you, and you want to play with the, you know, you want to be up against the domestic players in, in a retail business, then, then uh, having a branch makes, makes good sense. I might pass that one back to Michael, who I think you mentioned in one of our conversations that you've quite a number of both. Two branches, and then we also have about seven or eight freedom of services. Um, and I would I reiterate the same key points. Our biggest branch is in Poland, where we have a very large commitment with 300 staff, with 900 salespeople, and it is about that physical presence. You're competing with the domestic. In the markets where we're freedom of services, we're more of a niche player, mm -hmm. and therefore it wouldn't make sense to make that big commitment. It's horses for courses. <coughs> Um, we'll move on then from the past to the present um, and take a look again across each of these markets about who are the who is the customer or the key customer in each of these territories, what do they want to buy, and how do you reach them? What's your means of distribution? Um, so we'll, we'll take a snapshot of that from each of our panelists, and we'll start with you, Michael, and, and run across the table. Okay, so we have two very, very different businesses. So our UK business um, is really a high net worth type business where you know, our average investment, single premium, quarter of a million, we would do two to three cases a week north of a million. And that is a very sophisticated market. And then we have a Polish domestic business, which is regular premium savings plans, 50 pounds a month sold by people doing door to door sales um, and both coexisting within the same organization. So a wide range of different customers different needs um, and very different sort of outlooks. So yeah, it makes for interesting work. Um, yeah. Liam, or Neil rather, yep. Yeah, I could maybe say some of the same things. That our, our business model is uh, bank assurance. So our distribution is, is all through uh, Banca Montepaschi di Siena, their, dis their, their branch network. They'd be one of the, the biggest uh, banks in Italy. So, you know, the likes of Bank of Ireland or AIB so if you're, if you're a customer of Bank of Ireland or AIB, initially, if you're a customer of uh, Montepaschi or Intesa, it's the same sort of thing. So we'd have customers, you know, from, it's all uh, really investment products, unit linked investment products. We'd have customers who would have an investment of 2,000 euro or 2,500 euros, and we'd have uh, other customers uh, because we have a retail customers, but we also have a private banking uh, network. So we'd have customers with uh, policies of 40 million uh, euro so it's it's a wide it's a wide remit uh, the, uh, the the type of products that that they're that, that we sell I say we have a, a our parent company initially is also an insurance company and as I mentioned earlier they have uh, with profit type business uh, so our customers you know a lot of them 
we will share the customers with our, with our parents so they'll have some of their assets invested in with profit and then they'll have other assets invested in, in unit linked products. I would say the Italian customer by and large is, 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 is quite conservative and maybe even more conservative than the Irish customer. So therefore they're looking for guarantees, they're looking for protection or, or, or high fixed, uh, fixed interest uh, content. So you know, we structure products for, for that sort of need. Okay, thank you. Um, Liam? So uh, we would be selling typical retail products. It's uh, retirement savings and uh, regular premium business predominantly, and it would be uh, income protection, uh, critical illness. Um, in Germany, sort of every working person has, a, has their own income protection policy. That, that's the way it works, so it's quite a large market. Uh, <clears throat> So it would be throughout Germany and um, also would include occupational pension schemes on a defined contribution basis, which is quite a, a good area of opportunity in, in the market. Um, retirement provision from the state, which is quite generous, is, is diminishing and under threat. So there's a sort of a, a growing market for pension savings. Um, we sell exclusively through independent intermediaries, so it's a, it's a broker, we're a broker operation, and we would be the sixth largest broker company now in, in Germany. Um, there's about 80 companies in total in the market, and five years ago we would have been about 13th largest, so, so it's certainly a, a growth uh, story. There's uh, broker pools that are prevalent in the market, and most quotations will be done through comparison engines, so it's quite important to be to, to be represented well on those. Uh, and I guess the key selling proposition for us, as I said previously, is, is the, that we would tend to have lighter guarantees than the traditional providers, but uh, better returns and more exposure to, to real investment, which is particularly important for pensions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We'll move on now to the challenges that um, I suppose the cross-border sector is facing today in those countries. Now, we're all working in the insurance sector. We deal with challenges on a regular basis. But is there something unique to what the cross-border sector is facing? Um, we're going to discuss um, a number of those over the next few minutes. We'll start with um, was the question of language and culture. And if I may direct this to you, Neil, um, how big a challenge is that for AXA MPS in Italy? Um, yeah, well, it, it is a challenge. The first thing I think of is maybe the, the time difference. Uh, and I don't, I'm not referring to the one hour time difference between Ireland and Italy. <laughs> I'm referring to, you know, Italians start meetings when they're ready <laughs> and, 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 and finish meetings when everybody's had their say. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that was the first thing. I think when I joined the, the, the company 14 years ago, it was a bit of a culture shock for me. Uh, I'd come from uh, an Irish company. Uh, with a kind of an Anglo-Saxon mindset and it was interesting when I first joined in, in, in Italy uh, at the time you know they were very deferential towards mm -hmm. people in authority and you know I was immediately promoted to doctor I was dottore gyna <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, you know I found that interesting now I think you know at the time there was there was kind of a culture that you know what your boss said that's what you do you don't necessarily ask why? Mm -hmm. But you know, you're definitely going to do it. Uh, but I think that's changed over, over, over time. Uh, and I think uh, that, you know, that uh, I think, you know, may, maybe I'm ingrained in, 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 in it, in it uh, so long that I, that I don't notice such a big difference between cultures between Ireland and Italy. And, you know, in fact, one thing I, I definitely notice is that the, the, the sense of humour between uh, Irish and, and Italians are, is actually very, very, very similar. Uh, but uh, you know, other things I would say, you know, I, I think, you know, Italy has a strong political past, uh, and I would say present, uh, that, uh, you know, they definitely have, you know, uh, a long-term view in terms of how things, uh, how things will work, um, even if maybe in the short term there's a lot of panic, but there's always a kind of a long-term uh, mindset. Uh, the other thing I think, you know, you, you mentioned about, uh, uh, about language. Language is certainly, uh, is, is certainly important. Uh, uh, I think, you know, one of the challenges we had when we first set up was that, in fact, 20 years ago, English wasn't very much spoken in, in Italy. 
and it was only the people at the very top of the organisations that were Ita that were English speakers. Uh, so, uh, you know, having having Italian uh, is important. And even now, uh, let's say uh, the the younger people in Italy now nearly all speak English as a second language. But it's having Italian is still important because you're in front of you know your customers are still you know all, are are all Italian. So I would say about two thirds of my staff. Are, are Italian, uh, you know, all the customer facing ones, but even some of the actuaries that are involved in product development uh, because they want to be able to talk to the distributor, they want to be able to, to talk to customers. So it, Italian it, it is helpful there. And we have some actuaries from Italy in, in our team. We have other actuaries from Ireland. So having the mix of the two uh, cultures, and in fact, in, in our company, we have more than just Italians and, and, and Irish, we have multicultural. I think that diversity is good for kind of for development and, and for innovation. It's really interesting. Thanks, Neil. I, I won't ask you if you've got a cupola focal, and I wish I could say that in Italian. <laughs> Liam, I'll move on to you and ask you about I suppose what I'm aware of is a, a challenge in the German sector, cross-border sector. Um, is solvency to harmonisation? Yeah, um, I suppose, uh, first of all, I'd say that solvency two has obviously been very important to the development. Uh, of Canada life in Germany, and that's because I suppose Solvency II helped the German companies recognise that the, the onerous guarantees that, that, that they had, and uh, over recent years they've seen them move to lighter guarantees and move in our direction. But uh, we're, we're selling into, a, as I said before, a, a very cautious um, client base. They want to know that the company they're dealing with is financially strong, and they're naturally wary of anything that's different. You know that uniformity uh, is, is very prevalent in the market. So one of the one of the things that I, I suppose is striking is that the level of solvency two ratios in Germany would typically be in the 300 to 400 percent for companies offering quite large guarantees, and uh, as in Ireland, it'd be more typically in the in the 175 percent range. So I suppose it's not so much the, the calculation because. Um, I suppose that there are differences that obviously the, the, uh, the, the long-term guarantee facilities under Solvency II are very heavily utilized in Germany, uh, but also the fact that it's, uh, with, they're, they're all with profit companies predominantly and therefore the loss absorbing capacity of technical provisions removes perhaps 90% of their capital requirement. So, so they look very strong, but they hold relatively little capital. Uh, and so, so things like that, I think and it's more in the, in the pillar three and in the disclosure that, that it would be helpful if the SFCRs could bring out to a greater extent that, yes, some companies are extremely solvent, but, you know, they will dip into the policyholder's pot <laughs> when, 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 uh, the need, when needs must. Is communication so, so key to sort of addressing that and explaining that in the It market? is, yes, but you're one voice, uh, you know, and, and you've got many competitors. And mm -hmm. I suppose as the gro company grows larger, the, the challenge to... to uh, sort of make your point, yeah, be mm -hmm. becomes greater, yeah. Thank you. Michael, we've seen the number of players in the UK market have in recent years. What's driven that? So there's a huge amount of price compression mm -hmm. going on. Um, the average offshore case into the UK is north of half a million. And a lot of them are basically empty wrappers. So the insurance company is providing a vehicle in which an advisor will put funds into it. Um, they're largely become commoditized and the price has been driven down you know it is not untypical for the fee on a case of over a million to be five basis points um what that's done is it's meant that scale has become crucial and over the last 10 years we've seen as you say about half of the firms exit the market and even of the say five who are really active in the market now between ireland and the isle of man about half of those are now owned by private equity or equivalent types of firms. And again, that's been driven by, there isn't that much new business profit for a lot of these firms, and a lot of it's driven now by financial engineering, extracting what value they can from the back book. So it's, it's really price pressure mm -hmm. and huge price compression. Thank you, and I'll stick with you for a minute because um, Brexit has been a dominating the airwaves. Um, I'm not sure what Theresa May is doing today, yeah. but um, how's Brexit impacting Prudential? <laughs> So the, there's a couple of different things going on. So what you will see is there's been a lot of Part 7 transfers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of companies have moved European businesses that were part of UK entities into Ireland. So we moved 
some Polish, German, Irish, French, Maltese business from our UK entity to Dublin. Um, a number of other companies have done much bigger transfers, so Aviva Standard Life. So there's been a lot of consolidation into Ireland on the back of that. Um, in terms of the offshore market into the UK, the UK has brought in a temporary permissions regime, which has meant that no matter what happens, it will continue as is for the next three years. So that gives us a lot of stability, and it's been a unilateral move by the UK. Um, of bigger concern is, as they've gone through all of their rules in order to update them for Brexit, um, in some places they've done what appears to be a relatively clumsy control-alt-delete, remove all references to the EU. And what that's <laughs> done is create an environment where it's likely the Crown dependencies will have a major competitive advantage over Ireland or any other location in the future so that uh, companies based in the Isle of Man, Jersey, mm -hmm. Guernsey, will now have preferential access to things like policyholder protection and other stuff. Now, it's still three years away till the temporary permission regime mm -hmm. expires, and this feels accidental at the moment as opposed mm -hmm. to deliberate strategy, mm -hmm. but if nothing else changes, I think that would put Ireland at a disadvantage going forward. That certainly sounds like a, a risk for us to, I suppose, to watch and see how we can manage it. Um, and I suppose thinking about that general move towards countries, I suppose, wanting to have more control over its, its industries and so on, is there, a, is there a drift towards protectionism, I suppose, in the sector? Is that a threat or a risk to us? Um, Neil, do you have any views on that? Yeah, I certainly think it is a risk. Yeah. Um, you know, and certainly for Ireland, because, you know, we're... We're, we're an exporter, really, in, in financial services. Uh, so, with you know, with Brexit, you know, you have country looking to take back it, its own control. But there's also that sort of uh, talk in, in other countries in Europe and in, in, in the bigger countries uh, who are you know quite naturally looking to have business written within their own borders. Uh, so, um, you know, but that that isn't consistent with you know with the the, the, the framework. Uh, so, I think. It's important that we're, you know, that we're diligent, uh, that uh, that uh, we're, we're vigilant, uh, and that uh, that we speak up when there are, and you know, and that you know, we, we depend on, let's say, regulators, you know, like the CBI and the College of Supervisors, uh, EOPA, uh, to you know, to to identify when there are, let's say, local regulators, you know, introducing uh, rules which you know, which, which aren't consistent with the European framework. So mm -hmm. I think it's a risk, um, but, you know, it, it's, it, it's one that we need to manage. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Um, Liam, um, what would you say has changed most over the years um, in, in terms of your market? Well, um, undoubtedly the, the low interest rate environment has uh, completely uh, sort of decimated the traditional with profit products in Germany and uh, as is, at the same time the need for, for retirement savings has grown. So I think those two factors have been very big changes in Germany. Um, the, the market itself has seen some contraction over a number of years um, and also they've seen a move towards lighter guarantees and products with some exposure to, to uh, equities. So, so I would say that, that that's been a big change and it's a change that's been very advantageous for us. Interesting. Thank you. Um, we'll move on then to the future. Um, and as actuaries, I suppose we claim to be good at predicting the future, a bit while highlighting the risks and uncertainties and so on involved in the expert judgments. Um, so what does the future hold for the cross-border life insurance sector, which uh, um, we've heard um, you know, so much about already? Um, what does the future hold and what are the factors might help us to be well positioned there? Um, is there anything in particular maybe about technology? Uh, obviously the whole industry is, is, is embracing technology and the power of technology to be, you know, cut our costs, to reach more people. Um, Neil, is there anything from a technology perspective in relation to the Italian sector? Uh, well, I would say, let's say, my, my perception, mm -hmm. you know, in, Technology has been disruptive in, 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 in many industries, uh, but I would say in the life insurance industry, as yet, it's not really disruptive. Mm. Uh, uh, it is being used, uh, and uh, I would say the, you know, where, where, where we see a technology being developed a lot is in terms of servicing customers. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So with apps and um, uh, internet, uh, you know, private customer corner type things, uh, and it helps with, with, with costs, it helps the uh, communication more with, with customers. But where I see maybe the opportunity for the future is at the moment, our products are still very much sold and there's very much face-to-face -face advice. But I think uh, if and when online sales uh, become, become more, or if and when even remote sales through mm -hmm. video facilities and things like that becomes more, <coughs> more prevalent, I think the location of where you're based will become less and less an issue. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, you know, being based out of Ireland and, uh, and selling into Italy or, or, or elsewhere, uh, you know, I think uh, technology could support us in that. Thank you. Um, and speaking of opportunity, is there maybe, uh, Michael, I'll, I'll, I'll put this one to you perhaps. Um, you know, we've been successful in a number of markets, but as we saw earlier, you know, there are five big markets that are, are dominating. What about the others? Why haven't we been more successful there? And is there an opportunity there? So what you'll tend to find when you go around different countries in Europe is that they have a natural go-to market or go-to supplier of financial services. So for the UK, when they look for offshore, they look to Dublin or to look to the Channel Islands and they have a history of using the Channel Islands. Whereas you talk to someone on the continent about Jersey or Guernsey and they go, oh my God, you know, that is, but it's all what you're used to. So on the continent, Luxembourg is one of the biggest centers for producing offshore life insurance and therefore you go to France, they think Luxembourg is perfectly reasonable, but Ireland's a bit strange. Um, so that's going to be one of the key challenges is getting over those perceptions. And you know, there, there are other well-regulated markets with long history and well-established companies. I think one of the big opportunities for us is going to be innovation. A lot of the insurance policies written right now are really just wrappers around investment products and you can manufacture that largely anywhere and therefore it's going to be hard to get over that, those historical mm -hmm. connections. But as you look to do much more innovative stuff and you know, sort of real insurance, um, and the best example of that was the VA companies who came to Ireland. The sophistication that's available within the market in terms of the people, the staff, but also the regulator. Having a well-resourced and sophisticated regulator where you can have a conversation around this is something we're looking to do and we're doing it in a well-managed way actually is a competitive advantage. So as the industry moves more back towards writing real insurance, um, and that's likely to require an increase in interest rates because that's largely what drives the ability to do these things, I think there will be opportunities mm -hmm. that will emerge. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, if I may then be so bold as to ask for um, um, a prediction. Um, I suppose, what is your prediction for the future of your company, your market or the sector? Um, Liam, if I start with you. Sure, yeah. Um, I suppose starting with the company, um, as I said, we've grown strongly over the last five years and uh, there doesn't seem to be any sign of that, that changing. Uh, we're investing heavily in systems at the moment uh, with, with a stronger Germany bias because we've tended to use our, our equivalent Irish systems to date. Um, so I, I think the opportunity is there and we're well positioned and um, it's it's... It has its challenges. As I say, it's a hard market to, to, to be in, but um, it, it is a huge market and we're really only just beginning, I would say. Okay. Uh, in terms of the sector as a whole, uh, I, I would echo the comments made about just the, the flexibility and the abilities in, in Ireland. I mean, we are an export-driven company, a uh, country more generally. And uh, I mean, when you look at, you know, we're 5 million people here in Ireland and there's 450 people in a, a market we have ready access to. Mm -hmm. I, I would just say we're really, you've seen that we're, the stats shown this morning might be impressive, but really they, they could be significantly greater than that. And when you look at what's happening from a point of view of product innovation and that in the other countries, you know, there are loads of opportunities for us to, to, to engage and, and to be successful in that environment. It's, it's not as dynamic as I think mm -hmm. we see here in Ireland. Um, thanks very much. That sounds very exciting. Um, Neil? Yes, starting first with, with, with the company. I suppose, you know, we've had an interesting last nearly 10 years at this stage uh, because although Banco Montepaschi di Siena is the oldest bank in the world, uh, it uh, uh, had a lot of capital issues uh, over the last uh, 10 years. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's now been stabilised. 
so, you know, I think you know it was interesting. Even in those difficult times, the the customers stayed very loyal, uh, and that's a that's a feature in the in the in the <coughs> Italian market. Uh, but uh, so. I think you know I'd see now a period of growth uh, coming uh, uh, with a, with a stable situation. In terms of the let's say in terms of the industry as a whole, you know I would say it's a little bit linked to you know, if I start first on on the life business, we'll say in Italy, I think you know there's, there's great opportunities because most big groups are looking for capital efficient type products uh, and, and 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 tend to turn towards unit linked uh, for that. Uh, you know, and we heard from Liam as well that you know, with profit business, it, it, it companies are trying to, to to reduce their exposure to that. So, given that we, we focus solely on on unit linked, I think there's there's a, there's a, a very good opportunity there. And, and going wider than than the, just the life insurance industry, you know, from talking uh, to the IDA recently, there, there there's an amount of activity going on, not just related to Brexit. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but also in other areas, kind of wider financial mm -hmm. services, uh, and uh, you know I would say all of the big groups in in the world or most of them have uh, operations here in Ireland, which is great for a country of our size. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you know the, the future is quite bright. Excellent, thank you, Michael. So uh, the low interest rate environment was mentioned earlier, and you know, that has had a huge impact on the market, but it's also a massive opportunity. So when you look at yield curves, the real space where there's a gap in the market is for the cautious investor. Um, with current interest rates, they're sitting in cash earning zero, and if they want to take a little bit more risk, they can't actually get any extra return. And I think this is where insurers can offer some real differentiated things because all of the investment funds, all of the banks are very much restricted by the yield curve, and there are things we can do as insurers and in bringing real insurance in there that can help. And that's been the big driver in our success in recent years, has been doing with profits type propositions in that cautious space and growing. And we see that continuing to grow because we don't see any change in the low interest rate environment in Europe anytime soon. And I think that's the big opportunity for our industry is to provide different solutions into that space to the solutions offered by the banking industry or the investment industry. And that's very much where we need to focus. And I think it's, it wears the opportunities across Europe because um, the continental market is extremely cautious. I mean, it was referenced to both Germany and, and Italy already, but across the continent, relative to the UK or Ireland, they are extremely cautious, and that cautious investor has been very underserved by the current yield curve. Okay, thank you all. Um, I, I think we've been um, very lucky to have um, such a distinguished panel here today. Um, we're almost out of time, um, and I know coffee is beckoning, but I expect our panellists will be out there and if you wish to...